Welcome and thank you so much for joining us for this very special 5 by 15 for an electrifying evening of storytelling um, for this special lockdown edition. So we've got hundreds of people signed up this evening and I'm not surprised for this fantastic lineup. Um, but thank you as ever for your support. All of our speakers have got books which are out and we will be putting the details in the chat and on Twitter. So follow along with us and do support our speakers and their books and independent bookshops like Newham Books if you can. Um, as ever, the podcasts and the recordings will be coming out um, in the next day or so. So keep an eye out for them and help us to spread the word. So I won't um, take up too much time with introductions and I will move on to our first speaker this evening. We have John Preston returning to 5 by 15. Last time was that we were just recalling, he came to speak about a very English scandal, which was his book about Jeremy Thorpe. And it was turned into an award-winning BBC drama, which I'm sure many people have seen. And he has another very successful adaptation of his historical novel, The Dig, which is out now with um, Ralph Fiennes and Carrie Mulligan and available on Netflix. And if you haven't seen it, then I urge you all to definitely watch that. So he's here tonight to talk about something completely different. Um, it's about Robert Maxwell and his new book, which is called Fall, The Mystery of Robert Maxwell. It tells the story of Maxwell's extraordinary life, his rise and his fall. So welcome, John. Thank you very, very much for being with us. And I will hand over to you now. Thank you. Um, almost exactly 30 years ago, in March 1991, Robert Maxwell made a triumphant entry into Manhattan Harbor. And he was on board his yacht, his enormous yacht, the Lady Ghislaine, named after his youngest daughter. And he'd come to buy the New York Daily News. And the New York Daily News was kind of like the sun and the evening standard rolled into one. And whoever owned the New York Daily News wielded enormous clout. Uh, it's no coincidence that several times during the 1980s, Donald Trump, had tr a figure who in many respects, Maxwell kind of foreshadows, Trump had uh, repeatedly tried to buy the New York Daily News as a springboard for his political career. And when the ink is dry on the contract and Maxwell is installed as the new owner of the New York Daily News, something astonishing happens. The Cardinal Archbishop of New York offers prayers of thanks. People break into spontaneous dancing in the street. And when Maxwell that night goes to the most fashionable Chinese restaurant in Manhattan, the entire restaurant, all the diners, get up and give him a standing ovation. And just a few days before this, Maxwell is engaged in negotiation with the then proprietor of the Daily News, who's a man called Jim Hogue. And at one point in the negotiations, something happens that makes a great impression on Jim Hogue. Maxwell's butler brings him his lunch on a silver tray. And Hogue is busy doing something else and he's a bit distracted. And he suddenly hears this enormous crash and he looks round, and Maxwell has picked up this silver tray and just dropped it on the ground. And crockery goes everywhere and food and broken glass and whatever. And Maxwell goes, it's cold, bring me something else. And what makes the most impression on Jim Hogue is that neither Maxwell nor the butler behave as if anything remotely unusual has gone on. But it does beg a number of questions about Maxwell, or rather one question in particular. How did he get to be like this? Nine months later, just nine months after he's been fated in New York, Maxwell disappears off the back of the Lady Ghislaine in circumstances that have never really been fully explained. And two weeks later, it turns out that there's a 750 million pound debt in his companies and that 350 million pounds has effectively been looted from the mirror pension funds, thereby depriving a lot of people of the prospect of a tranquil and reasonably prosperous retirement. And from that moment on, Maxwell's name was forever blackened. And even today, 30 years later, it's still a kind of byword for corruption and deceit. 
which of course begs the biggest question of all what went so horribly wrong and since the loose theme of tonight's talk is storytelling i thought i'd tell a couple of stories about maxwell that may possibly answer one possibly both of these questions maxwell him said, himself always said that he never actually had a childhood i was never young i never had that privilege and in a way you can understand what he meant he was actually born in a small town in the east of what was then czechoslovakia which i'm not even going to try to pronounce which had a very large jewish population small town but jewish large jewish population maxwell's family were jewish and he was brought up very devout orthodox family but when he's 16 in 1939, he sets off essentially to find his fortune. And whilst he's away during the war, three of his siblings, both his parents and his grandfather, all die in Auschwitz. And this really is the, the prism that you have to see Maxwell's life through. For years, he denied being Jewish at all. Um, and indeed, one of the reasons he chose the name Robert Maxwell was because it had no, as he saw it, whiff of Semitism about it. But when he did very belatedly discover, rediscover his Judaism in the mid-1980s, you have this sense that he was haunted, swamped almost, by all this banked up survivor guilt. Throughout the war, Maxwell had dreamt of getting hold of a commodity which he'd be able to obtain for next to no money that would be in huge demand after the war. And in 1946, he was sitting in Berlin where he was running an allied newspaper which was designed to reintroduce Berliners to the joys of democracy. And one day this man walks in who's the biggest publisher of scientific journals in Germany. And he says, can you help me? I have this terrible problem. No one has published any of my journals during the war. And I have this huge backlog of stuff. And Maxwell's first instinct was to kick him out because that was pretty much Maxwell's first instinct with anybody. And then he thinks to himself, hold on a minute. Maybe the thing I've been dreaming of has just landed in my lap. And the commodity was knowledge. And it was an absolutely brilliant idea. And by the time that, by the mid late 1950s, Maxwell has become the biggest publisher of scientific journals in the world. And let's just say for the sake of argument that Maxwell had died in 1961 rather than 1991, he would be remembered very differently. I mean, it's easy to say, and it's some truth in it that Maxwell was only ever kind of driven by expediency and that he always had one eye fixed on his profit margins. That's true. But every so often, the other one would give off this kind of idealistic glint. And I think Maxwell did really care about the scientific research he was involved in. And actually, by disseminating the research that of a lot of scientists, he actually he paved the way for a number of key breakthroughs in medicine, chemistry, physics, and so on. But, and it's a very big but, Maxwell was obsessed with getting a newspaper, owning a newspaper. And it was this that brought him into, within the, uh, into contact, as it were, with Rupert Murdoch. And that both Maxwell and Murdoch for almost 30 years were locked in this kind of titanic struggle to be essentially the world's biggest media mogul. And Maxwell came to see Murdoch really as his nemesis, because every time Maxwell tried to buy a newspaper, Murdoch would snatch it from underneath his nose and Maxwell become more and more furious. Um, and, and more and more obsessed. I, I mean, I, incidentally, I don't think Murdoch saw Maxwell in those terms. I think as far as Murdoch was concerned, Maxwell was this kind of perpetual irritant that he could never quite manage 
to brush off. And it drove murder nuts that they were always being mentioned in the same breath. And of course, they shared the same initials. And it's not until 1984 that Maxwell finally succeeds in buying a newspaper. But he buys the Daily Mirror, the Sunday Mirror, the whole stable of mirror titles. Uh, it's no coincidence that uh, Murdoch doesn't want the mirror and indeed wouldn't have been allowed to get it because he already owned the sun. And it's easy to forget that actually to begin with, Maxwell was a rather successful and indeed popular proprietor of the mirror. And he loved uh, the looseness the dissipation of Fleet Street, and the journalists, certainly to begin with, they may have kind of sniggered behind their hands at him putting his picture all over the mirror and so on. But he did a number of rather clever things, uh, which made him very popular. He reinstigated this um, convention at the mirror, whereby, which was responsible for the fact that the mirror had the biggest, uh, highest alcoholism uh, level in Fleet Street, that every week this elderly man would push it in a kind of once white linen jacket, would push a trolley of bottles around the editorial floor and hand out to each member of the editorial staff their alcohol allow allowance. And it was considerable. And they had a little fridge to keep it in as well. And here we come to another question about Maxwell, which is why why is he so vilified? I mean, yes, he did a terrible thing. There's no question about that. And yet, you can come across serial killers that have had a better press than Maxwell. And I think one of the reasons is that journalists hate missing a good story. And at the mirror, they were literally sitting on top of one for years. Maxwell had been taking money out of the pension funds and nobody realized it. And when belatedly they did, they turned on him with ter terrible ferocity and everyone else followed suit. And when Maxwell dies in 1991, world leaders queue up to play tribute to him. And they all say what a terrific guy he was and what a great humanitarian and so on. And two weeks later, the same people are saying what a dreadful man he was, how they always knew there was something fishy about him and so on. And as I said to begin with, the prism you have to look at Maxwell through is his family. And Ian Maxwell told me a story about coming in this, towards the end of his father's life. He came into Headington Hill Hall, into his father's bedroom, and Maxwell had a kind of early flat screen TV mounted on the wall. And his father was standing there with his nose pressed up against the glass. And Ian said, what are you doing? And on screen was this footage of newsreel footage of Jewish people being unloaded from trains at Auschwitz, with some of them being sent off directly to the gas chambers and some of them being deemed fit for work. And Maxwell straightened up, turned around and said, I'm looking to see if I can spot my parents. And whatever you think of Maxwell, it seems to me that that's a desperately poignant story. And in many respects, his life is like this morality tale of someone for whom nothing was ever enough. Money, sex, power, booze, everything he could do to fill this kind of aching void he stuffed in as it were, and nothing was ever enough. And it's for this reason that although Maxwell unquestionably caused a lot of people a lot of misery, perhaps, just perhaps, the most miserable and tragic figure of all was Robert Maxwell himself. John, thank you. That was an extraordinary story and 
beautifully, beautifully told. Thank you so much for all of your books and stories um, from the archeology span of Sutton Hoo to the story of Robert Maxwell. And I hope that everyone watching will, if they haven't already get a copy of Fall, The Mystery of Robert Maxwell, which is out now. And John, thank you again for being with us. We wish we could see you in person. Um, so that was extraordinary start. And now we will move to our next speaker, who is the equally extraordinary novelist, Monique Ruffy. She's an award-winning Trinidadian born writer, and she's also the latest winner of the Costa Book of the Year um, and Fiction Award for The Mermaid of Black Conch, which is a very vivid story of loss, of friendship, family, and uh, the destructive power of jealousy. And it is all set on an imaginary Caribbean island. So an amazing piece of escapism, I think, for right now. So um, we're very pleased that Monique is going to be in conversation with Rosie Boycott for 15 minutes, and I will hand over to Rosie now. Welcome. Hello, um, and thank you. And Yes, it's great to be part of it. And that was a fantastic talk from John. But Monique, I'm so pleased that you're here. I unashamedly say that I loved this book. I didn't know what to expect. It, it's a strange title. It's a strange idea. And I was hooked, as they might say, from day one, as indeed was your wonderful mermaid. Can you possibly just give us a picture of what the story is before we go on to talk about some of its elements, which we won't get through all of them. It, it's a love story set on a Caribbean island, and it's a love story which is very strange. Um, yeah, it's um, it's a story um, about an ancient mermaid who was once a woman, cursed to be a mermaid, cursed into exile, cursed into, and the curse is eternal. And she's captured um, during a fishing competition and rescued by somebody who doesn't really want to keep her, wants to throw her back in the sea. Those are his intentions, but she starts to sort of demetamorphosize very quickly. And then <clears throat> she sort of, it's about um, how would we take care of an, uh, an ancient uh, woman, um, our history? Um, can this woman find a, a place for herself in the fairly modern world? And of course, it's a good old love story. It's more than one love story. And I really wanted to write a love story. Well, yeah. you succeeded admirably. Something that I, I, felt, I feel very naive now for not realizing it, but your, your mermaid, Akayaya, um, she has been cursed many thousands of years ago. And the curse that makes someone a mermaid is in a sense, jealousy and they they stop them being sexual. I've never thought of it in that yeah. way that mm -hmm. you literally seal up their legs and make yeah. them a fish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the Spanish say about mermaids, you can't eat them and you can't fuck them. Um, it has this, um, yeah, it's, an ambig it's about banishing um, her sexuality. So denying her her right of passage into erotic love is, the thing that, I mean, that's, you know, all our old stories come from um, the old patriarchy and they're full of these kind of um, witches, old ladies, uh, virgins, young ladies that need to be taught a lesson about their sexuality. So most old stories are, are worth rewriting. And I, I when I, I'd been dreaming about my, a mermaid and then I came across the story and I thought, ah, oh, right. I'm going to give her back the thing that she was denied, which is her a rite of passage into erotic love. But yeah, I mean, it was her punishment was to desexualize her. So you get the love affair that that dominates the book, although there is another one, um, is between the mermaid and David, the fisherman, and. When she moves to his house, he takes her there. She literally her scales start falling away, and she is revealed as the woman she was. You're, it's very, very descriptive. Tell us what she looks like. Um, she's an indigenous woman um, from the Greater Antilles. She would have been Taino. Um, and she's, I wanted her to have a, a shamanic way about her. So she knows things that we don't. So she's got this transparent way with nature, the natural world. So she's constantly looking at things differently. Um, and she's, you know, she's quite messy and slovenly in a way that, well, we think she is, but she might not see that. 
and um, and obviously she doesn't like wearing clothes. She would have come from a, a, a people who didn't wear clothes or much, they didn't cover themselves. And so she's just herself, really. I just wanted her to be herself, not necessarily the kind of, you know, um, cutesy mermaid beauty. I wanted her to, to be a different kind of woman altogether, really. No, she's a very, very uh, extraordinary woman. And David, of course, falls tremendously in love with her. Mm. And that that story is a very dominant story. But of course, there's another love story going on, which mm. represents a white woman who has inherited the plantation as such. So all the way through the book, there are echoes of the colonialism, echoes of the one time life of slavery. And yet you make the other great woman in this book, Arcadia Rain, is also extremely lovable and interesting and very empathetic. Is she a type of person that you know through your life in the Caribbean? I, I do know, I do know a handful of women like her um, who are, you know, tied to, they also cursed because they're tied to land and the land is tied to atrocities that they didn't personally commit, but it all comes with the territory. Um, I guess I got to, I mean, I have every respect for Jean Rhys and what she wanted to do, which was give um, the mad woman um, a story. But I, 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 she, we kind of got ourselves in the regional canon stuck with this mad white woman who is also a bit of a Freudian hysteric, who is, you know, just, just mad and driven mad. And it's all fine, but I just, was a bit annoyed. I'm just sort of done with that, really. I just want to put her fine, but I wanted to create a uh, well likable um, somebody who's caught up in the drama of what's going on around her, and um, and she happens to have pale skin. She happens to be European. She's white. She has a Caribbean um, consciousness, and I know a lot of people like I know a lot, but I've I've come across numerous people like Miss Rain, and so uh, and she's. You know, and her love is cursed as well, and her child is cursed, and there's a lot of cursing going on in this book. But, but yes, you say that her love is cursed. She has also a kind of forbidden love in the same yeah. way that David and the mermaid have forbidden yeah. love. Yeah. And, but you allow that love to, to kind of, she, she, has, she is in love with someone called Life, which is an extraordinary, wonderful name, and he does reappear. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to, I mean, there's also Porthos and Priscilla who I enjoyed writing them. Yes. But life, life for me, I mean, you know, as a, I'm a white Caribbean woman as well. And, and the, the life love story is something that, you know, is I'm only too aware of this problem of, of, of being um, in some way punished by, um, by the whole damn thing, the whole history of the place the politics of the place, this is a forbidden power play, I can't, I'm not allowed, I'm forbid, this is forbidden. But what if they fell in love when they were children? Mm -hmm. What if this love had taken root really early on, before they understood the dynamic of it? And then the punishment starts to set in on them when they grow up. And of course he wants to leave, he wants, he's never gonna be, you know. So I, I just, again, I know this, I know there's something about this love story that I understand and know. And I enjoyed writing it. And there's a really big scene where they're in bed and he, he gets out and he wants to say, so, and they get nowhere with it. Hmm. They just get nowhere. They just get, is it his, history or love, history or love? And, and I mean, to sound corny, but love is um, as big as the politics for them. You know, there's a, it's, it's powerful. And they have a child, Reggie, who is born deaf, who, who strikes up the most touching relationship with Akaya. And yeah. how did that, how did you see that, that relationship between the deaf boy and the ex-mermaid? Again, you know, these things just come, don't they? I, I've struggled with hearing loss on and off for about a decade, really bad, related to an autoimmune illness I have. So the writing of a deaf character was always at coming. It was always going to come. I, and then, so Reggie, I, felt, I thought, right, I can write Reggie. And then I did some research around the 70s and provision and, and, and then this idea of him also being proud and deaf and having deaf pride and being autistic and being completely fine. He's cool. He's a cool, cool little boy. 
but he hasn't got a friend in the world. No one can be his friend. And so, of course, the mermaid and him are going to just like, like, you know, get off to a great start with their hands, with the hand um, sign language. So, I mean, you know, you invent one character and then the other one, you know, they all, ha they all start coming and then, you know, they, you know, this is what happens. And uh, did you need Priscilla? Did you need her to be in as the, <clears throat> as the person who won't leave things be, who is the gossip? Well, you know, I know, a Pris I know many Priscillas as well. And um, in Caribbean bookstagram circles, they've been discussing this book and Priscilla gets the most airtime, I'm told. It's Priscilla is the one they're all, um, they all like to discuss. And, and again, there needed to be a baddie. There needed to be somebody, there needed to be forces of, you know, and and Priscilla is somebody who you know the village the village gossip the village every small village has a Priscilla um, all over the world, and um, but she's complicated too you know I didn't want her to be a stereotype I wanted her to have reasons, and and again also there's the monetarization of um, the mermaid, and it's there all the time she's worth something and of course this echoes with the a huge story of trafficking of people in the region. And I think I was sort of trying to see, you know, this idea of all of us could be, if we're given power, all of us could torture somebody else if we were told to. Um, and there was something there about, okay, let's see what happens when money, big money appears and how many people, um, how quickly does, it, does a good man turn bad, like nicer country initially wants to put her back, but suddenly thinks, oh, okay. So this is, so Priscilla's just, you know, Priscilla emerged as well. And I enjoyed writing her. Yes, I think you can feel that, that actually you enjoyed writing all these characters that are, that are truly memorable. I mean, they are archetypes, but they're also, they just, they don't conform to, to stereotypes. It's a completely wonderful book. And I'm afraid that's where we must leave it, but I can't, urge people enough to pick this up and just escape for a while but you'll also find yourself immersed in some really really big themes about jealousy and feminism and people and history and geography and yeah it's a wonderful achievement Ronique and thank you so much for being with us tonight and thank you, back, back thank to you, you Daisy. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, the Mermaid of Black Conch is out now, and um, I hope that everyone will pick up a copy. Um, so next up, in a testament to our incredible speakers this evening, we have another winner of the Costa Prizes from this year in the biography category, Lee Lawrence, for his memoir, his very powerful memoir, The Louder I Will Sing. And Lee is a social entrepreneur. He works with marginalized people, helping them to find their voice, to manage conflict, and to achieve justice. And we are really honored to have you with us, Lee. Welcome and over to you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm a yes. great speaker. So um, essentially, I'm going to take you through a journey where we went from a gross injustice to restorative justice. And I'm going to start at the beginning. So I'm going to talk about this beautiful lady here which is my mum, my biggest inspiration, and my hero, Cherry Gross. She was born in Jamaica in 1948 and came to England in 1962. My mum raised, raised six children. She was a loving and caring person, well known in our community. She didn't have much, but whatever little she did have, she was always willing to share. I describe her as a lioness. She loved music and she loved to dance. We grew up in a place called Brixton. And Brixton for me was a, a fun, exciting place to live. It was safe. We never left, we left our doors open. We played out on the streets. And um, there was a real sense of community spirit. They say it takes a village to raise a child. And I felt like Brixton for me was that village. And if you ask me when I was a, when I was a child, what I wanted to be when I grew up, I would have said a police officer. But that dream was crushed on the 28th of September, 1985. It was a Saturday, 7 a.m. in the morning, and I was just 11 years old. I heard a noise while I laid asleep in my mum's room. 
So I woke up and I saw my mum walking towards the door. And I thought, whatever it is, mum's taking care of it. And I laid back down. Then I heard another loud bang this time. I jumped up and I saw this man holding a gun in his hand and pointing it at my mum and shouting at her. And in a very faint voice, I heard my mum say, I can't breathe. I can't feel my legs and I think I'm going to die. In that moment, I just got hysterical and I was screaming and I was shouting and I was saying, what have you done to my mum? What have you done to my mum? And this person then turns around and points his gun towards me and says, someone better shut this fucking kid up. I froze. I was shocked and I was scared. I got ushered out of the room where I met another 30 officers. There were dogs, there were guns. It felt like a nightmare and it felt like someone had taken my house and just shook it. I was met in the living room with my other siblings raging from a 20 year old, my oldest sister who was 20 year, years old and my youngest sister who was eight years old in the house. My mum was also babysitting two children who were seven and a two year old. My mum got rushed to hospital and we were left in the house, vulnerable and left with the police. And the only updates that we were getting about my mum was over the news. And they had said that she had passed away. So I went into the kitchen and grabbed the knife and I tried to slit my wrist. And someone came in and pulled the knife from me. Crowds started to build up outside the house because the community was outraged that there was an innocent woman shot in her home in front of her children and they wanted to know why. They weren't getting any answers. So then they marched up to Brixton Police Station demanding to know what happened. They were, still weren't getting any answers. That turned into frustration, then turned into anger. And before you know it, that was the catalyst for the second waves of riots for the 1985 riot in Brixton, which I call an uprising. A couple of days later, I went to the hospital, St. Thomas's to go and visit my mum. So luckily it was a rumor and my mum was still alive. I remember clearly going into the hospital room and the doctors coming in and explaining that your mum will never walk again. She was paralyzed from the chest downwards. The bullet entered her shoulder, shattered her spine and came out through her hip. Hearing that news was devastating and I can only imagine how my mum must have felt hearing that herself. Two years later, there was a criminal trial and the officer who shot my mum, Douglas Lovelock, was totally acquitted. So there was no justice. And I remember seeing that on the news and going up to my mum and saying, mum, how do you feel? And she said, the police are a force and we can't be the force. And she just accepted it because she had to cope with it, where it never really sat well with me. For the next 26 years of my life and my siblings' lives, we became a carer to my mom. Unfortunately, in 2011, on Easter Sunday, my mom passes as a result of the injury that she sustained back in 85 when she was shot. All the hurt and the pain and the sense of injustice came flooding back. And I didn't know where that energy was gonna go. And I just want to show you another picture of how she ended up. There was a glimmer of hope in the fact that there was an inquest into my mom's death, which would allow us to reinvestigate what happened and the circumstances which led up to the police coming to my house that day and shooting my mom. But it came with its challenges. We were denied legal aid on three separate occasions. So we finally, finally had to put a petition together. And thankfully, we got over 130,000 people to sign that petition, went to town 10 Downing Street, presented it. And a week later, the decision was overturned and we got access 
to legal representation. That in turn allowed us to have an open and transparent inquest hearing, and it allowed the truth to be heard. And 12 jurors came back with the findings of multiple serious failings by the Metropolitan Police at all levels on the planning and implementation of the raid on my home that day. They were looking for my brother who wasn't there and never lived with us. And they ended up shooting my mom and essentially killing her in the end. That came with a public apology for the first time 28 years after, sorry, 29 years after the incident. An apology that we deserve to hear, but the person who most deserved to hear that apology was no longer with us, which was my mum. So it was a really bittersweet moment for us. And we said to the Metropolitan Police, we are not willing to accept the apology unless it comes with some accountability because a life has been lost. They then challenged us and we spent the next two years battling with the Met until we ended up in the High Court and it was only then that the Metropolitan Police conceded and accepted accountability. The High Court judge then recommended that we go into mediation to see if we can work things out between us. At that point, I had no idea what mediation was. Sat down with my lawyers and they explained the process to me. And they also brought up the idea of restorative justice, which I knew nothing about. So my, my, my lawyers explained a little bit of the process and I went away and thought about it. And 24 hours before we was going into mediation, it came to me like an epiphany moment. I was gonna use pictures to communicate what happened, who my mom was, what happened to her and the impact that that had not only on her, but on us as a family and the children who had to witness that on the day. I've used some of the pictures today that I, I, I shared in mediation. And there was one other that I used to try and communicate the story. And it was of my daughter, Harmony. And the reason why I used this picture because she was eight years old at the time and I wanted them to connect with the, with the youngest child that was in the house at the time when they shot me because we were adults now. And I also wanted to explain a story of two weeks before we ended up in mediation, I explained, I saw my daughter was going, going to school and I shared a book in her hand and I called her back and I saw the words police and I said, what book are you reading? She said, Dad, I've read about the ambulance and I've read about the fire service and now I'm reading about the police. And I froze and I thought, this is gonna be telling her about all the great and wonderful things that the police do and I'm not disputing that they do some of that work. However, we have a personal story that's going to conflict and counteract what she's reading. How do I tell her that with balance one day? And I said to the senior high-ranking officer who was in mediation with us, the way I tell my daughter that story is down to you and how we resolve this between us today. And that person got up and he had tears in his eyes and he looked at his, his, his lawyers and said, my lawyers are not going to like what I'm about to say right now, but I would hate for my mom to go through what your mom went through. And that was the moment for us. That was the first time that, that the Metropolitan Police showed any type of empathy towards us as a family for what they had done to us. It was a small but very powerful moment. It allowed us to start engaging and looking at a way forward. And it allowed us as a family to start that healing process. As an outcome of the restorative justice um, outcomes that we, we discussed on the day. One of them is a memorial. So we asked for a permanent memorial to be erected in honor of my mum and the community who rose up for her for that injustice 
to be there not only just as a reminder of what happened, but also to act as a place of reflection and learning. Because we want what happened to never happen again. That memorial has been designed by the world architect Sir David Ajay and will be unveiled at the end of April this year. Mm. So, in conclusion, restorative justice, I found the process so powerful for my family and myself that I went and trained in restorative justice. And essentially, restorative justice is about bringing a victim and a perpetrator together to discuss the harm that's been caused. In restorative justice language, we say the harmed and the harmer. For the actual harmed person, it gives them a voice and it gives an opportunity to try and heal and move forward from what has happened. Because as we know, hurt people tend to hurt people. And for the person who's created the harm, it allows them to see the damage of their action, how, they, how what they have done and inflicted onto others has impacted not only them, but also others. And there's research to back up that when, when the harmer goes through a process like this, they're less likely to reoffend. So in conclusion, I just want to say this. What my mum went through, that terrible injustice, that suffering and pain and that trauma that we experienced as children, if through telling our story, we can add to the growth and the awareness of restorative justice, that people engage with it as a way to look at justice and to reconcile, then that would be a great legacy for my mum to be associated with. Thank you. Lee, thank you so much. That was extraordinary, incredibly powerful. And um, just after Mother's Day, what an amazing tribute to your mum. Thank you so, so much for being with us. And The Louder I Will Sing is your book and it's out now. And I hope that everybody will get a copy and we will share this talk as much as we can. And I'm really excited about the memorial as well. So congratulations on that, that journey. Thank you very much. And Thank you. And so I will now introduce our next speaker this evening, the fabulous Thomasina Myers, um, well known to all of us as a cook and a food writer and a television presenter and an entrepreneur and the founder of Oaxaca Restaurants. So Tommy has been with us before at 5 by 15 um, and she's here today to talk about a very different kind of cookery book which has been created by 54 of the UK's best loved chefs all of them from their own homes, recipes, from home cooked recipes that they have been cooking during the COVID-19 lockdown. And it's in aid of hospitality action, which is supporting the hospitality industry during this really difficult time. So we are thrilled to have Tommy with us and she is going to be talking about building back better, but with food. So welcome Tommy and thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Daisy. Um, what um, incredible talk so far. Um, and particularly, wow, Lee. I think having a legacy is so important and uh, reflections on COVID is really what I want to talk about, which is linked to this incredible book, which I shall talk more about um, in a bit. Um, so yes, I'm co-founder of Oaxaca, uh, also an ambassador for the Soil Association. Uh, and a lot of, and, and also I helped set up a charity called Chefs in Schools for which I'm a trustee, um, whose aim is to tackle national obesity through putting better food and food education into schools. Uh, I'm constantly intrigued by um, that link between intensive food production and how damaging it is, not just for the environment, but for public health. And, um, and really how we eat is so inextricably linked to public health, but also how polluting we are across the world. Um, so that's a bit of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I will talk about these different things through my personal experiences of lockdown, through my company Oaxaca's experiences of lockdown, and then just having a look at the national experience of, of COVID and, and how we've come out of it 
thinking about food in a slightly different way. Uh, so more personally, uh, I got to spend a lot more time at home. And I think many chefs who actually gave recipes to this book, which is not a chef at all. It's like really lovely home cooked recipes. You know, people like Heston Blumenthal cooking very accessible, easy, simple things, as opposed to his normal, incredibly difficult, complicated recipes. Um, you know, lots of chefs were cooking more at home and it was a very creative time. You know, there's not much to do other than watch television, read lovely books, but cook, we all had to cook because restaurants were shut. Um, and as someone who's absolutely mad about cooking, that was rather wonderful for me. My sourdough started bubbling away very early on, got my kefir going, going to my local food markets. And quite early on, actually, I started talking to a publisher about writing a new book, which for me at least felt like there was some progressing, moving forward and combating that dreadful sense of Groundhog Day, particularly in the last lockdown, those awful January Mondays that were felt so dire at many times. Um, I think if, 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 if the last 12 months give me lots of time for reflection amidst the mayhem of homeschooling and everything else I was juggling, I think Oaxaca also had a great time of reflection on how we could look at the kind of ensuing months where we were forcibly shut and how we could best use that time. I think most immediately there was an urge in all restaurants really to, to feed people. Um, the restaurant shelves were empty, uh, people were in need. And particularly in the early stages, that kind of that need to feed um, the nurses and doctors on the front line. So we teamed up with people like Angela Hartnett uh, at Cook 19 to um, get our chefs back in a couple of our kitchens and produce meals for 11 IC unit, units across Greater London, which was incredible. We worked with chefs in schools to cook food, to put in hampers, to feed kids in school holidays who would otherwise get quite measly school vouchers that didn't really do much. Um, and, and then generally we were part of a huge auction that Hospitality Action, this charity that this book is, all the proceeds are going to Hospitality Action, which is a charity that really does look after people who've been adversely affected in our industry. So we were up to lots trying to help people. And I think the most heartwarming, which is, a, is an expression I kind of often take offence with, but it really was heartwarming to see how our industry reacted in, in, in these successive lockdowns and that feeling of community that food gives, that breaking of bread and how our in, instinct led us to trying to feed people in our community and to feed those people in need. Um, so that was kind of wonderful. Um, on a more personal note for Hacker, we've always had this ethos of sustainability and we really were looking at how we could reopen and, and really learn about the best way forward because as I've already said, that link between what we eat and climate change is so important and so relevant um, as we know more and more and how, you know, as we hit this kind of climate emergency. So we shifted all our pork and chicken production to free range. Um, and we were really pushing ourselves on our vegetarian um, element of our menu. So we've always had about 30, 35% of our menu being vegetarian. Now it's about 50%. In fact, 50% of our food sales are now vegetarian because we just keep putting kind of mouth watering veggie choices on. So that felt like a really positive way to open up our doors. In the third lockdown, we considered shutting um, and we just took that decision that we should keep on opening. And really that was for the morale of our staff. 700,000 people lost jobs last year in our industry. And we felt it was just so important to have a message of positivity for, for some of our teams, quite a lot were still on furlough, but for a percentage of them, and just to keep that feeling of doing something and progressing. And actually it was, it was a great decision in hindsight. We sold 100,000 tacos from here up from today since December. Uh, people have been kind of raving uh, and wanting to get all of our food. So it's been great for customer interaction, great kind of feeling of positivity in our business amidst the chaos of our industry. Although, of course, that hasn't helped us losing vast amounts of money every week. And part of what I've been doing is really trying to campaign the government to let us open sooner, because all of the data shows that hospitality was never more than um, you know, 3% of transmissions at the height of the pandemic was happening in hospitality. Much more was happening in hospitals, in, in care home centres and at home. And um, as an industry, we spent millions on making our places safe and hygienic and, and good places for people to be able to come in and see each other, which is a very human need. Um, so that's the kind of 
happening at, in the industry and then taking a step back again just looking at nationally what's happened so there was a report last week um, by the world obesity um, federation that that said 2.2 million of the 2.5 million COVID deaths happened in countries with really high obesity rates in countries like korea um, south korea and japan where they have really high intensity of populations in big cities they have very very low rates of covid there is a direct correlation between the health of nations and how their response to covid has happened so in the uk we had the third highest rate of covid and we've got the fourth highest rate of obesity worldwide 52 percent of our shopping basket is ultra processed that is foods that are mainly but made up of highly produced um, and environmentally toxic soy wheat or corn intensely produced and then kind of stitched together by industry and the kind of mix of sugars and fats to produce cheap food uh, that tastes delicious but actually does us no good at all in fact we now know that 90,000 people in this country are dying every year because of diet related disease that's overtaken alcohol it's overtaken tobacco it's a national crisis uh, and it's no longer one that we can afford to, to overlook. I think for, for decades, people have been campaigning that we need to have better food. And the, the kind of general response has been uh, food, good food, that's a luxury. It's not a necessity. Uh, it's important that we have cheap food so that everyone can afford to eat well. But we now know that cheap food is not actually cheap, cheap at all. That same report said that 4.2 trillion pounds could have been saved if com if countries with high obesity rates had put in many many practices to look after public health uh, prior to this pandemic um so i frankly as someone who's been adversely affected um personally but also in my industry i'm kind of fed up being told to stay at home to protect the nhs the nhs needs to be protected but it needs to be protected by a much more holistic look at how we feed um, our public um, and, and look after people too, because the other outcome is seeing this huge inequality of food and the fact that by, by virtue of, of where you're born in this country and your social economic background uh, is, is where you've got access to good food at all. Because whereas I might happily chomp away on Pringles crisps and kettle chips as much as I want, I know that my diet is bulked up with also fresh fruit and vegetables and my body is good at absorbing all those good things. Whereas people on lower incomes are only eating this very toxic mix of, low, um, of, of ultra processed food. So on a positive note, there are many, many brilliant charities now looking at how we can address this. And purely um, with my link to chefs in schools, we've seen how 50 pence per pupil per day, less um, we can produce really good home cooked food that is much better for kids than this kind of awful toxic ultra processed food. Um, I think we now know as a public that people on low income, it's not acceptable that they're malnourished and have no access to fresh fruit and vegetables. And there are talks about putting taxes on some of this ultra processed food to help pay for people on low incomes to have access, access to fresh fruit and vegetables, which do cost more, but it's so important for public health. So I think um, actually with part of two of the national food strategy, coming out at the end of this year it's important for all of us to sit up and take notice because good food is something we all need to take account of now we've seen how badly it's affected this country with the harshest lockdowns of pretty much any country in the world um, and it's something we can no longer accept i think it's high time we all fought for better food for everyone no matter what your background and let everyone have that pleasure of breaking bread with each other and eating great delicious food so that's my um, that's my rounding up and a great way to do it and look after each other and people who've been affected badly by COVID is to buy this wonderful book with all its delicious recipes in it. Thank you. Thank you, Tommy. Um, we couldn't really agree more with you about the need for healthy food and for a holistic look at health. And, um, and thank you for bringing up the national food strategy, which we've also been thinking and talking about at 5 by 15. And congratulations on your beautiful book, which I think is available to pre-order now, um, Chefs at Home, and all in aid of hospitality action. So thank you very, very much. And we will see you again soon, hopefully in person next time. Um,
And our final speaker from this evening is Michael Rosen. He is beloved author and former children's laureate and long-term friend and star of 5 by 15. Last year, we were all incredibly anxious for Michael as we heard the news that he had been diagnosed with COVID-19 and he spent six weeks in hospital in a coma undergoing many more weeks of rehab and recovery. So um, throughout his stay in intensive care, there was a notebook at the end of his book, which lots of the nurses and the caregivers put messages in. And now we're so thrilled that Michael is back to tell us about some of those messages and his new book, which is a, a book about his experiences and his recovery. It's called Many Different Kinds of Love, Life, Death and the NHS. So welcome, Michael, and thank you very much for being here. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much, Daisy, and thank you very much, John, Monique, uh, Lee and Thomasina for some incredible stories. So that's, that's what we're doing tonight, isn't it? We're telling stories. Um, and you mentioned that I was here. Um, that's true. It was by no means certain that I would be. I don't mean just tonight, but that uh, I'd be alive. So um, you've obviously heard some very uplifting and some tragic stories already this evening. And I certainly don't want to bring people down when I tell you my story. Um, I was uh, getting ill exactly a year ago, started coughing had symptoms that seemed like flu. Um, but then bit by bit, I was finding it harder and harder to breathe. But if you think back a year ago, we were under instruction not to ring our GPs, not to rush ourselves to A&E, and it wasn't possible to get tested. So what we had to do was ring 111 and talk to uh, a paramedic um, who was in charge of ambulances or was, would be on an ambulance. And I did this twice, uh, separated by a day or so, I think. Um, difficult for me to remember things. And um, I, uh, he, he told me very clearly that uh, I should just carry on taking the paracetamol um, and all was fine. But Emma, my wife, she spotted something about me. Uh, the way she puts it is that it looked as if death crossed my face. Um, and so she got in touch with a neighbor who is a friend and also a GP and she came over twice actually and the second time she came over she handed Emma an oximeter one of these things that test the whether you're taking up oxygen in your body and um, the it scored 58 it's supposed to score 95 58 you should technically be unconscious if not dead so quite how I was alive and and Katie who has the letter telling us this in in my book a quite overwhelming letter that I find very difficult to read without crying um ordered me and um, em ordered emma to take me to the hospital and um because there was no point in trying to get an ambulance and so i emma rushed me to the whittington hospital where, not far from where we live and i was then whisked in suddenly there were doctors around me and a mask over my face and for the next few days it looked like i was all right but then um i dipped and so I can remember a doctor standing by my bed saying to me, um, are you all right to have a ventilator on, on you? Are you? And I didn't even really know what that was, but he explained that they would have to knock me out and put a ventilator on me. And, and I said, what's the chance of survival or something like that? And he said, 50-50. And if I don't, he, he said, um, zero. So I remember signing this with a sort of slight sense of a kind of lightheadedness because I was so short of oxygen that I think that's you know, people who climb Everest, not that I've done it, they experience this oxygen lack. And uh, so I said, oh, right, that, that feels quite good, really. And so I signed and then it then goes blank. I then lose basically April and May. They've gone because uh, I was put into an induced coma. And the only way I know about this, what is about seven or eight weeks, the only way I know about it is either because what Emma tells me, because she was getting bulletins, or the thing that you described, the patient diary. And I didn't know about this. I didn't even know about intensive care, to tell you the truth. So I had watched 24 hours in A&E on the telly. Um, they, they, every morning, the nurse who had looked after me at that night wrote a letter to me. So I have a letter for each, virtually for each night that I was in intensive care. And it's not just a letter about me, it's about the care that they're giving me. 
and it is overwhelming. I can't find words to describe the kind of care that they gave me because, you know, Lee's told us about his mum and how he, she cared for them and then how they cared for their mum. And that kind of family care that goes on, we, all of us here have got, who are, well, we've all been children, uh, but if we're parents, we've done that, we do that. But if you're in intensive care or indeed in hospital for anything, they're these complete strangers who are doing these things that we do for our children, mopping your brows and wiping your bums and doing all this stuff and making sure that you're, you're alive and looking at you and, and checking you. Um, and these people who didn't know me, uh, some people coming from places all over the world, Brazil, the Caribbean, countries in Africa, Uganda, Poland, uh, Ireland, all over the world. And I can see in their letters, they're saying, you know, you did well last night, keep fighting. And I'm thinking, this is unknown to me. They even stood round my bed on my birthday and sang me happy birthday. Um, I mean, I, I don't know anything about this. My birthday's May the 7th. I'd already been under for you know, five or six weeks. And then bit by bit, I was brought round and Emma played a crucial role in this because they did something naughty given there were COVID restrictions. They wheeled me out onto the fourth floor atrium looking out over London and Emma held my hand and showed me um, my children, um, messages from my children. I must get through this from my children and I don't know anything about it. She showed them to me on the, on the phone and I don't know anything about this, but the consultant, the wonderful Professor Hugh Montgomery said this was the game changer because there is always a worry that you don't wake up. And um, apparently when I was wheeled back into the lift, I became in his words, lucid. And so I was suddenly joking about things. Um, and from then I then had to recover and so I was put on another ward and then eventually into a rehab hospital because I couldn't stand up. I couldn't walk because my body had degenerated so much after all that, that I couldn't stand up. So I can remember the first times people tried to get me to stand up three. And I think on one occasion, four people, because I'm quite big, I'm six foot two, whatever it is, and propping me up and my legs, I remember looking down at them and my legs were shaking and I remember thinking they're like my dad's legs when he was dying, white and sort of trembly and a bit wrinkled. And um, I remember thinking, God, I've got my dad's legs. And I couldn't stand up. I was panting because basically my blood pressure was incredibly low. So I couldn't stand up. So anyway, I got to the rehab hospital and then these incredible people, another wave of incredible people who we call physios and occupational therapists, they wouldn't take me saying, well, I, I can't walk, like, like meaning I'll never walk again because I, I got myself into a frame of mind where actually bed was quite a nice place to be. And I did actually envisage myself being like my friend Chris Kaufman's grandmother, uh, living downstairs and in bed. And then I remembered she was 90 and I was 73. And so I thought, well, no, I better not be Chris Kaufman's bubba. That's the Yiddish for grandmother. I thought I better not be her. And then they got me a frame and they taught me how to use the frame. And I thought, right, I'm a Zimmer person. Yeah, it's, it's Michael Rosen Zimmer. Um, because I'd seen a bloke in the neighborhood who had a stroke and he gets around the neighborhood with his Zimmer. So I thought I'm a Zimmer person. Then they chucked that away and said, no, what's gonna happen now is you've got a wheelchair. And I thought, this is brilliant, a wheelchair. And I wheeled myself to the window and this was in the middle of lockdown. I had this wonderful feeling of the street outside St Pancras Rehab it's not right just around the corner from the station and there was a woman watering her geraniums. And I just remember having this wonderful feeling of, oh, wow, look, I can do that on my wheelchair. And I told him, I said, I'll come home in the wheelchair. And she said, you won't, you won't, you can walk home. And I said, no, 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 no. She said, I'll be in the wheelchair. And then they told me that I shouldn't have the wheelchair and they gave me a stick, which I called Sticky McStick Stick. And they taught me how to walk with the stick right with the stick and then you move to your left leg and the right leg and it gave me a routine and I had this routine with the stick and then they told me I had to climb the stairs and I said no 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 I'm not going to do the stairs I'm just going to be on the ground floor at home I won't go upstairs they said no no you're not going home until you can climb the stairs and so I climbed the stairs with the stick and then the night physio the weekend physio came on and he said you're becoming a bit stick reliant Michael I thought yeah you bet I am I like, I like being stick reliant it's good 
I was very, very proud that I could, uh, you know, walk just a bit across the ward with the, with the stick. And then he said, no, no, you're going to get rid of the stick. And so I'd, I would carry the stick round and I got to the loo and I was singing to myself that M people song, search for the hero, in is it? No, look, search, look, search for the hero inside yourself. And I, when I got to the loo and I sat on it um, and I thought, I must, I wonder whether there are any other people in the world who, who got to the loo singing search for the hero inside yourself. I mean, I love that woman, Heather Small. Um, I just thought the way she sang that just it did something for me. And so that did something for me that I'd got to the loo just carrying the stick instead of walking it, sticky mix, stick, stick. Um, and so, yes, I got home and I did walk through the door without the stick, without the wheelchair, without the zimmer. Um, and they'd done that for me in about, well, in three weeks, basically, uh, propping me up, these wonderful people. Um, and then since coming home, which was in late June, I've had to learn something else. I've had to learn quite a few things about recovering and recovery, because people say to me, oh, you know, I'm on social media and people say, oh, it's fantastic. You've recovered, Mike. And I think, well, I haven't actually. I'm recovering because, you know, it's something I've become is this person, sort of post-COVID person, long COVID person. Then I thought, no, I'm somebody who's becoming. And then I thought, no, no, actually, that's what we're all doing. I mean, the stories that everybody's told, you know, whether it's Maxwell or whether it's Monique's story or Lee's terrifying story and, and his own uh, thing about restorative justice and Thomasina and the change she's doing, these are all about becoming and changing. And that's, I've learned that because I think, I think before I got ill, there was something about me, whether it's arrogance or whatever, there was a sort of, what I call a certain certainty. You know, I'd sort of put things in chronological order and, and knew about the sort of certainty of it. And I relied on it. Oh, well, I've got this certainty thing, you know, and enjoyed having telephone conversations with my brother about which holiday did we go on when we were kids? Was it Northumberland before Wales or Wales before Northumberland? And we'd sort of enjoy being authoritative about it. And now it, it, that's gone. It, it, there isn't the certainty. And actually, I have to do that. I call it owning my own frailty. Um, and the, the, the nurses and the doctors, they've taught me to do that. But whereas in hospital, you are in a way confined and you rely on those people and you say, help, uh, my toe hurts because my toenails fell out. Oh, my toes, my toes. And people rush around and do things with your toes or whatever. Um, once I'm home, it, I have to learn to do that stuff and own it, if you like. And so this book is really tells the story, but actually tells many little stories each time, because that was the only way I could write about it. I couldn't write about it in a kind of cohesive whole. I've written about it just in tiny fragments. So um, if I just say uh, I wrote, they've been worried about my low blood pressure, but they brought me the Daily Mail. So it'll be fine in just a moment. Or there's the one about the loo. And then I'm a traveler who reached the land of the dead. I broke the rule that said I had to stay. I crossed back over the water. I dodged the guard dog. I came out, I've returned. I wander about. I left some things down there. It took bits of me as prisoner, an ear. I can't hear with that ear. And an eye, I can't really see with that eye. They've they're waiting for me to come back. The ear is listening. The eye is the lookout. So that's how I've written it because that's the only way in which I could sort of conceive of it really in these little chunks because it's sort of too much. So I sort of think I, what I've done is I've written a mosaic in order to express this year and trying to piece together the story and then these feelings in my state of recovery at home. Michael, thank you. Um, it's so extraordinary to hear you. And I can't tell you how happy it makes me to hear your voice and your stories and to know that you're, you're there and your infectious joy for life. And, um, and congratulations on this extraordinary book. We're so grateful to you and to all the NHS staff for their incredible um, support that they gave you. We were all rooting for you through that whole Thing and it's just been um, incredibly um, stressful and difficult, but just wonderful to see you. And the book, Many Different Kinds of Love, 
uh, Life, Death and the NHS is out now. And I know that New and Books, who we um, have long worked with and supported, have signed copies, which I hope people will also be able to get. Um, thank you, Michael. And thank you really to all of our extraordinary and incredible speakers this evening for their stories, which have totally blown us all away. Um, John Preston, Monique Roffey, and Rosie Boycott, Lee Lawrence, Thomasina Myers, and Michael Rosen. Um, all of these books are out now and um, we will be back very soon. Thank you for your incredible support for 5 by 15 um, hundreds of you online tonight. And we will see you all again very soon in person. Um, take care for now and good night. <laughs>